Hello, welcome everyone to the fifth annual uh, Turing lecture here at King's College, Cambridge. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank everyone who's online. We, we expect over 300 people to be participating online today. Uh, so we uh, will have a talk and then we will have a question and answer session. So we we're gonna have plenty of time for questions and answers. But uh, those online, I, I think it would be best if you, if you entered your, your um, questions online in the, um, uh, through the webinar interface. And you can do that anytime during the, uh, the talk. And then at the end of the talk, we'll have people here reading questions uh, from online. Uh, and of course, you here in the audience can participate directly. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's that. Uh, I'm going to introduce Catalina Kanja, who is the, uh, she was a PhD student here in computer science, and she finished her PhD in, uh, in 2021, last year, and she's currently working at DeepMind. Uh, so, Catalina. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Um, it is my immense honor and pleasure to introduce you Dr. Raya Hatzel today. Um, Dr. Hatzel is the Director of Research and Robotics at DeepMind. She also holds um, an appointment at UCL and is an Ellis Fellow. Um, after taking a somewhat unconventional route towards AI research, uh, studying for an undergraduate degree in religion and philosophy at Reed College, uh, Dr. Hatzel won the Outstanding Dissertation Award in 2009 for her PhD thesis in machine learning. And then um, a few years later in 2014, she joined DeepMind to work towards building artificial general intelligence. Um, in her research, she focuses on continual learning for AI agents and robots, having so far produced many approaches to solve uh, the problem of catastrophic forgetting. Uh, I had the great privilege of collaborating with Dr. Hatzel in my uh, internship at DeepMind in 2020. And um, our discussions and brainstorms were had a fundamental um, impact on the course of my internship and uh, yeah, were very useful for, for my progress overall. So without further ado, I'll now let her tell you more about um, all the exciting and very recent research uh, towards building AGI. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for the introductions, Tim, Catalina, um, and uh, very honored to be the fifth Turing lecture here at King's College. Um, uh, it's a, a special honor for me to come to King's College while my daughter is still a, a, a student here, been enjoying seeing King's College through her eyes um, as a student, and now I get to see it as a, a visiting lecturer. So, um, uh, I am uh, the Director of Research on Robotics at DeepMind. I've been there for about eight years and have seen the company uh, grow and change over that time and really do some very exciting, exciting things. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about where I think uh, some of the ways in which we are using um, modern AI methods to solve problems, science problems, history problems, and how that might have uh, impact for all of us uh, in, in the future. I need to click, right. So first I thought it appropriate to start with Turing. I really enjoyed reading um, Turing's articles. I had read the, the, the article about the imitation game um, uh, when I was, uh, I don't know, several years ago. But just recently I read his paper on called Intelligent Machinery, which was never published uh, and which he wrote in 1948. And in there, he speculates about how one might build an intelligent machine. He uses the analogy of the infant cortex, and he talks about an unorganized machine and how the infant cortex is trained with data, with experience, and with feedback in order to become to mod be modified into an intelligent organized machine. And he thought that the same might be capable if we could build such an unorganized machine and then uh, to be able to train it with data. Um, he speculated that, that some critical components of such a machine would be memory, would be sensory inputs, 
and would be the use of feedback mechanisms, such as reward or punishments. Um, and this was quite remarkable to think about this perspective of, of what an intelligent machine could be, because in a lot of ways, this is how we think about AGI now, 70 years later. So a, a little quote from that paper. Sorry, we are echoing. <laughs> uh, Turin wrote, as he was thinking about how to build this, what experiments could be done? How would one build an unorganized machine? And what would the methods of organization be once you had that machine? And he said, I feel that more should be done. I would like to investigate other types of unorganized machines and also try out organizing methods that are analogous to our methods of education. I made a start, but found it altogether too laborious at present. And he continues, when some electronic machines are in actual operation, I hope that they will make this more feasible. <laughs> this just, this made me sad because I wish Turing could be with us today. Um, because a lot has changed in the 70 years since Turing wrote this. Um, let me talk about a few things that I think are most important, most relevant to AI. So first of all, let's start with, sorry, which direction I'm pointing this? Uh, let's start with neuroscience. So um, neuroscience is important. You can see in his, in his writings from 1948 that the idea of how human intelligence works should be really relevant, really important for how we build an intelligent machine. Um, and in the last decades, we have seen relentless, steady, important uh, breakthroughs being made in understanding intelligence, human intelligence, mammal intelligence, other species as well. Um, just to call out a few things, there's uh, mapping the, the human genome, it's been a huge effort obviously, and has you know, probably decades more res uh, results to come out of that. Um, there's been work on grid cells and spatial navigation. Um, this is work that I've done that I find fascinating, understanding how it is in the human brain that we know where we are in the world and that we know we can recognize places, know if we've been somewhere before, remember how to navigate from here to there and are able to locate ourselves locally in a room, in a country, in, a, in the world be able to have that understanding. That's due to structures and particular cells that we have in the brain and in the hippocampus, which actually, at least in humans, are also used for um, concept development and abstract thought and abstract reasoning. So fascinating study and a huge amount has been done in, in that area of work in the last 10 uh, years or so. And then also decoding the, the visual cortex. This is a nice example because we've made a lot of progress say we, I mean, neuroscientists have made a lot of progress in understanding how the visual system works in humans, a lot by understanding how uh, computer vision, computer models of vision uh, work and comparing the two, understanding how representations are formed as one goes from the retina through, to, through the different layers of the visual cortex. And that has really helped in, um, uh, been, been helped by also looking at how we train large computer vision models. So this has been really valuable for AI. And now, in, now I really see this back and forth. Neuroscientists use AI methods to advance their research and AI researchers take inspiration from neuroscience and cognitive science to build models. Compute, computation. So um, one has to call out this, obviously that this is what uh, Turing was bemoaning not having and what we have now in spades. So Gordon Moore in 1975 said that the number of transistors and resistors on a chip doubles every 24 months. It's been almost 50 years and we are still on that path. And every year somebody says, we're done. Moore's law is dead. And every year we keep on going onwards. It is amazing, truly amazing. Moore's law, means that we have uh, systems like this, huge distributed compute systems that allow us to do much more than feed YouTube to all of us. They allow us to um, uh, build enormous simulators to, and for the purposes as of AI, to train very large models, to store a lot of data, and to build the most 
unorganized large scale machine that Turing could possibly imagine. Back one. And last, I want to mention AI methods, um, because of course the methods for understanding how we can build and, and how we can train that intelligent machine, those methods of learning have changed a lot since Turing's time. So um, just a few themes that I'll point out. First of all, neural networks and back propagation or gradient-based optimization. Um, this is something that first appeared in the 1980s. Um, was uh, went out of fashion for a while and now has come back into fashion. Why? It's a simple method that scales really well with the compute and Moore's law I showed on the previous slide. Um, probability theory using, uh, uh, use, using Bayes um, approaches, Bayesian approaches allow us to understand not just what, a, uh, what an AI model can do, but what it can't do the very important question of how do we assess the uncertainty of a model. This is important not only for giving, the, giving good answers, but also for allowing humans to interact um, with these AI models. Um, reinforcement learning, this has been, uh, again, this is a concept that, that's been around for a few decades, but in the last decade, what we've seen is that we can couple reinforcement learning mechanisms, training using um, positive and negative feedback, with neural networks in order to train for a specific, um, uh, for a, to solve problems that otherwise we couldn't solve. Moreover, we can not only solve those problems, but we can sometimes get to superhuman performance on those, those problems. And I'll give an example later in the talk of reinforcement learning. Um, and then lastly, uh, it just in the, in, in the last few years, um, the last 10 years or so, what we've really been seeing is the return of much, much bigger neural networks. How big are they, you ask? <laughs> um, so uh, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd give you a little, um, um, a few examples here. So I started my PhD in the early 2000s. And the first neural network that I came into contact with um, and helped train was Lynette 5, which was a small convolutional neural network used to identify handwritten digits between zero and nine. Um, it had 60,000 parameters in it, which means these are the weights that we change as we, um, as, as we optimize the neural network um, from data. 10 years later, uh, this was about the time just before I started at DeepMind, then AlexNet was released. And AlexNet was one of the first uh, large scale models that really, uh, um, surpassed significantly state of the art on a hard problem. In this case, the problem of identifying a thousand different types of objects in images, in ImageNet. It had 62 million parameters, much bigger. You're still not impressed. All right, 10 years later, <laughs> 10 years later, 2022, this year, um, others have released similar models, but uh, DeepMind, I'll mention, uh, released the model Chinchilla which has 70 billion parameters in it. Um, and this was a model that was trained to uh, simply generate language, or trained to pre predict the next word um, through a set of uh, uh, text inputs, and it has 70 billion parameters. Um, and that's certainly not the largest. I know that there are plenty of models that are now in the hundreds of billions of parameters. Um, so this is a, six order of magnitude increase um, since I started my PhD. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> All right, let's go on. So um, yeah, I, I, I wish that Turing could be alive today because I think that this is a really exciting time for exactly his perspective on what an intelligent machine is and can be. I'm going to take the rest of this talk and walk through a few different examples um, uh, sort of case studies where we've used AI methods. And uh, they're arranged um, in, in, in orbit here because some of them may seem a little bit more esoteric and some of them may seem a little bit more relevant. So let's start at the outside on the esoteric side and we will talk about ancient text restoration. <laughs> any, histor any historians in the room? All right. <laughs> 
so this is some work um, by my colleagues, uh, Janis Assail and Theo Summershield um, at DeepMind and the full paper you can read in, in, in Nature. Um, one of the exciting things about this work is that it was a great collaboration. It was a collaboration between DeepMind, two different Google teams, and then the University of Oxford, Athens University, and uh, University of Venice. And I know I'm not supposed to mention Oxford, but you know, <laughs> to do it sometimes. So the core problem here um, is that of understanding inscribed texts from the distant past. And these, um, the, 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 the study is properly known as epigraphy, epigraphy, I'm not sure. And um, these texts that exist on stone, stone blocks, they offer firsthand evidence for thought, for language, society, and culture of civilizations that are long gone. Um, and there are a lot of these inscriptions that have survived, but a lot of them look like this. So the problem for a historian is at least threefold. Um, first of all, the inscriptions might be damaged and their texts lost, so we want to do text restoration. Secondly, those inscriptions, you would think, well, you found the stone here, that's where, the, that's where it's from, but actually they can be trafficked, moved, stolen, lost, etc. cetera. Um, so the geographical attribution is an important part of the puzzle. And when are they from? Well, radiocarbon dating doesn't work on stone. So especially if that uh, uh, piece of stone has moved around, you don't have any chronological attribution. So three good puzzles, we can solve them all at once. Um, and this is an example of the actual restoration, the output of the model that was trained. Um, and I do not read uh, Greek, so I'm not going to try to, but this is a restored decree concerning the Acropolis of Athens uh, from the fifth century BCE. All right, so how does this work? Uh, the model here is called Ithaca, and it's actually available. So if you are interested in this, you can look it up and you can uh, play with it. You can feed in your own data, I believe and see what it has to say. And the way that it is trained is by taking data that we do know the whole thing. So luckily there's plenty of, of these stone blocks that are complete and we know all of the information about them. Um, we take that perfect information, we feed it through, we feed it into the network as a stream of characters and we process that through a neural network, which I'm not going to go into the details of, it's there in the paper if you'd like to know, and we ask the network to predict three things. One, what are the missing characters? We took out a few characters, what are those characters? Secondly, what is the geographic attribution? Where was it? And thirdly, when was it? Now, naively one might separate these into different problems, but of course they're all related, right? The where and the when and the what of the text are all intricately linked. So, we're training for these three different things, but actually they feed into each other and they support each other in a really valuable way. So training in this in a multitask sort of system made the whole, the whole thing work, work better. Um, and then we out, the model outputs, outputs some guesses. So this starts out as a big unorganized model, unorganized machine. We feed in the data sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase. We, feed back through the correct answers, um, propagate that back through and train the whole thing. The results are one of the, one of the thing that is, is, that's valuable about this system, about Ithaca is the interpretability of the results. And uh, so you can see at the top, I have a, pointer on me, a very small pointer. Um, you can see at the top here, that it actually produces three possible words to go in the, into this blank spot. And it gives a probability, a likelihood for each of them. So that's valuable because maybe the first answer isn't correct, or maybe in those alternate answers, there's more information there that could be valuable for the historian. <clears throat> Secondly, it also gives out a heat map, it gives out information, saliency information as to what parts of the context were important for giving that answer. Um, and that also gives a way to, gives, gives, gives a window in to interpret the model and understand its outputs. Um, uh, so this is the output that's given for geographical attribution, for instance, you also get a 
distribution over possible answers or top answers, and also you get a distribution over the different uh, uh, chronology. And in some cases, we have exact information about what exactly that date was of that, because it may have been written on the, on, on the slate as part of that or other methods of dating it exactly. Um, so we can assess how good these are. So just really quickly, um, I will mention a few results here. So on this slide, uh, what we can see is that the Ithaca model, the one that's highlighted here, does better than the models before it. So there's Pythia, which is a previous work, and it also does better than the human experts. So if you compare directly human experts and their answers to restoring the text, to giving the chronology, to giving the geography, then our model actually does better um, across the board. Some of these, it's good to be low, and some of these, it's good to be high. It doesn't matter. So Ithaca does well. It's not perfect, but it does really well. The interesting thing, though, is take a look at this line. This is what happens when you combine the human expert with the model. When you say, here's this model that we trained, take this, use it, learn it, just like we use our phone, just like we use you know, the different tools that we have for our lives, just like I use a computer as a computer scientist. We give this tool to the ancient historian and say, use this. And they're able to do a better job than the model alone or that they could, than they could do alone. This may seem, may seem obvious, but I think that this is a really important way of how we look at AI methods, but how we look at this emerging area, these emerging technologies that are going to change a lot of the things that we work on. In most cases, I think that using these, these new models as tools, tools for a doctor, tools for um, a mathematician, tools for a scientist, this is where their value is. Um, so Ithaca uh, was trained on these ancient Greek texts, um, but it actually has uh, impact on any disciplines that deal with ancient texts and any language, ancient or modern, could be applied there. Uh, that's because the method is relatively general. We can just change the data that we feed into it. Um, so this could help with identification and study of uh, different types of artifacts, maybe things that might have been uh, forged or uh, um, trafficked or that are simply newly discovered. Uh, so we look forward to seeing what impact this continues to have on the field of, of ancient, uh, uh, ancient epigraphy. All right, next stop is something a little bit different. Plasma stabilization. I didn't think I'd go there. But I didn't. Um, all right, so if you are there, there may be more physicists in the room than there were historians. I'm not sure, but if, if you'd like to know more about this and go into the, the, the details, then uh, the title of the paper is Magnetic Control of Tokamak Plasmas. Uh, this was a, a research project over the last, been about the last three years, um, and it was in collaboration with EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. And let me first talk about, uh, start off by talking about nuclear fusion for just a moment, uh, because this is the study of how we can develop energy sources using nuclear fusion. Um, Back in the 1920s, there was a British physicist um, by the name of Aston, I believe, uh, last name of Aston. And he had the observation that four hydrogen atoms weigh more, have more mass than one helium atom. The implication of this is that inside of the sun and other stars, that there might be a process of fusion going on that is emitting energy. That the colliding of hydrogen atoms to form helium and throw off a neutron on the way, that this might be responsible for the energy that is created by stars. So people worked about on this and thought about this throughout the 20s, the 30s. In the 1950s, um, there was a uh, conceptualization of what's known as a tokamak, which is a, metal, a magnetic confinement device 
where you can have a controlled um, nuclear fusion um, uh, uh, experiment that might happen where one might be able to harness the energy from this reaction that is happening within, within this device. Um, and you know, that was in the 50s. So same as the Turing, uh, as Turing, good ideas came, came up in, in the 50s. This is still today seen as being the most viable and the most practical way to develop nuclear fusion energy. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what's happening here. Um, how do you fuse two nuclei? Uh, you put them together and you push. Um, and the way in which you do that is by building something like this tokamak where you create the pressure and the heat in order to create plasma. A fourth state of, of matter um, where uh, electrons and uh, uh, nuclei move around and can collide and fuse. And the way in which you control this is by having these sets of magnetic coils, both inside and outside of this toroidal shape. And inside of there, you try to get to a state of having this plasma and having this fusion happen. You have to do it stably. And you have to be able to do it for long enough, maintain the state of plasma so that you get energy from it. Uh, so this is, the, the, this is the problem. If we look at a cross section within that toroidal uh, tokamak, within that containment device, then this is what you see. This is a simulator um, that's running. And what you see on the left is successfully controlled plasma. All around the edges, we see those little numbers changing. Those are different coils, and that's how you control that plasma. You try to get it to a point. I always think about this as being like you have air jets and you're trying to keep a balloon in the air or something, right? You gotta, you gotta sort of control this thing without touching it. And so you're trying to do that with the plasma. And if you don't keep it in the right position, if you don't keep it high enough, if you don't keep it alive, then it, 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 it falls apart or it goes unstable, bad things happen. Um, so that's the game. You want to keep the plasma alive, you wanna control the position of the plasma, and you wanna control the shape of the plasma. And the, the ways that you have to control it are all of these coils that you've got going around this. And then you have also, so 19 different ways to, um, buttons that you can press to control it and 92 different observations that you have. The way in which we decided to approach this is from a robotics perspective. Um, so I'm the director of robotics at DeepMind. One of the things that we do is develop algorithms to control robots. And when you control a robot, often you're controlling a whole bunch of different joints. For instance, a human robot might have 20 or 30 different joints that you're controlling. So you're sending a number to all of those joints very quickly in order to control the actuators and keep that robot moving along. Similar sort of algorithm could well work for this. So that's what we did. One of our algorithms is called MPO. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but that is a reinforcement learning algorithm. It's a neural network which is trained by doing reward maximization where the reward are these three different goals. How do we control and keep the plasma alive? And it took a lot of work in simulation because they wouldn't let us near the tokamak <laughs> for a long time. But eventually we were actually able to make this work so well in simulation that we were able to run experiments on the actual tokamak and use a deep reinforcement learning network to control the tokamak. So what you see here is the reconstruction in the simulator, the little dots around the outside, those are the observations of it. And we don't see the different control points. Um, it doesn't look like a whole lot inside of the tokamak, um, but it worked. It was stable and successful enough in fact, what we've been able to show is that we can create using our reinforcement learning, we can create all of these different stable configurations, which have been known theoretically by physicists, but have been very hard to actually um, uh, make stable in a real reactor inside the tokamak. So what we hope by working with the scientists at EPFL is that this will open up the scope for them to have a whole new set of tools. In this case, by the way, this was not a very large neural network. This was a very small neural network. Um, it was really just about that algorithm, about how we learn from 
the, the goals and the rewards of the system and using a neural network rather than um, trying to do it from, uh, uh, from using more traditional methods of control optimization. All right, so exciting work there if you're a physicist, then please check out more about this. So next stop on the journey is weather. Try to pick things that you know, have wide variety of perhaps impact on us. Weather forecasting is important. Um, weather forecasting is important because it's step one of understanding our climate. Right? So when we're trying to predict the weather for tomorrow or next week, we can also think about extrapolate out and think about the problem of predicting the weather um, in a century uh, from now. So weather forecasting, this, is, this was a project that we also started three or four years ago that I've been very involved with. Um, and it was a collaboration with the Met Office. So you see a theme here. I think that a lot of our best work has been through working with a partner on a particular domain it takes a long time to understand the problem, understand where the challenges are, and understand what the solutions are. And in particular, whether or not this is an area that really where a solution would be really fundamental, would be really important for the field and, and important for, uh, for humanity. So in this case, um, we worked with the UK Met Office, uh, Meteorological Office, and we identified uh, the problem that we wanted to solve. And this is called precipitation now casting. This is the problem of predicting whether or not it will rain and how much it will rain in the next 60 to 90 minutes for a given part of, uh, of the country. It's not very far in the future, right? It's now casting. That's the point, a very short window in the future. And you would think that if we can do a reasonable job of predicting the rain next week, we should be able to predict predict the rain in an hour. But actually the models that are used that are state-of-the-art models for, uh, for, for doing forecasting, big numerical dynamics, dynamical models that are used are not very good at adjusting to the current data. So they will stubbornly continue to say, nope, it's gonna be sunny today, even as the clouds are, are, are moving in. So, it is important to come up with a, a different type of method to think about whether or not we can predict the rain um, in, in, in the short term. And the, the output of this, it's useful for us if we want to plan a picnic, uh, but it's also used by experts who need to be able to, uh, to issue flood warnings, to uh, do air traffic control um, and, 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 and marine work. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges here. So uh, you need to be accurate. It's, uh, as I said, it's, it's important. Uh, we, we need that higher level of accuracy than, when, than what we can get from other approaches. We also have to account for uncertainty. We need to be able to give a likelihood, be able to give a probability of, of rain and how much rain. And the hardest one in that list is capturing rare events. It's not that important to know if it's going to uh, you know, sprinkle in an hour, but it might be really important to know if there's going to be a catastrophic storm or a flood situation. And that's what's hard for data because those events are rare and they're strange and they're a little bit different. So capturing those anomalies is actually a, a, a big part of the, of the challenge. Uh, so taking this into deep mind out of the Met office and saying, all right, let's think about this problem. Then we first need to think about, about data. Um, so what we focused on are these very large radar fields. And you can see these sort of bands of rain crossing uh, the UK and Ireland. And what we did was think about these as just a video, right? This is just a stream of videos coming in where we get a new frame of the video. Uh, every five minutes. So that's 288 uh, frames a day. Um, and it, each pixel in the video in each frame represents one square kilometer on the ground. So it's pretty high resolution. Uh, and we have data uh, from 2016 onward. So a lot of that, that produces a lot of data that we can work with. Now the approach that we wanted to train, the way in which we wanted to, um, to, to, to work on this was as a prediction problem. In a way, it's a little bit similar to the model I showed you for the ancient text restoration, 
we know all the answers. We know exactly how the rain evolves across um, you know, a few hours the day. Well, what we wanna do is to give the model part of the information, ask it to predict what comes next, and then uh, feedback how well it did and train the model that way. It's a pure video prediction problem that is conditioned on what has happened so far. Whoop. Um, so with an input being you know, a few frames from this model, maybe an hour or two of data, then we wanna say, predict what the next frames are going to be. But we actually need this to be a sampling model. So we want to be able to say, um, to be able to say, given these starting states, you know, given all that's happened so far, give me a bunch of possible outcomes as to what the weather is going to do for the next hour and a half. Um, because that's a one way to capture rare events. The model could produce a bunch of likelihoods, and one of those has a, has, has a, big, uh, you know, a big storm blowing up out of nowhere. And so it's important to be able to, to assess the likelihood of different types of outcomes and look at that by having multiple different sampled realizations of the, of the future weather. Um, so the method that we used is something called conditional generative adversarial networks. It's conditional because it starts, because we give it the starting point. Generate weather conditioned based on what I'm giving you as a starting point. It's generative because we're then generating what comes next. It's adversarial because we have a generator that's predicting what's gonna happen next. And we have another neural network, which is called the discriminator, which is trying to say whether or not that generation is good or bad. So it's a game that is played between two neural networks that forces the generator to get better at what it's doing so that the adversarial network has a harder job telling real from fake generated outputs. Some of you might know uh, something about this, this general approach. It's called a GAN, the Generative um, Adversarial Network. Um, and that's because it has more typically been known for producing deep fakes. So a generative adversarial network, again, produced those four images of people. None of them are real. Those are not real people's faces. Those are completely generated by a network. They are what we call deep fakes. So this type of network has also been used to generate false, false videos, false audio, false text. Um, I, I don't think that that is a good use of this technology, um, but I don't think that the technology is bad. I think that this is a really powerful technology and there are a lot of ways in which it can be used for very important things like what we've done here in using the same technology in order to uh, produce a better weather forecasting system. I just wanted to point out that connection. That's one of the fundamentally exciting things and powerful things about uh, AI methods is how general they are and how they can be used for very different things. Um, all right, so I just want, I will point out you know, sometimes it, it, it's a bit abstract if I talk about these things. So I just wanted to give one, one example here. Um, so this is actually a difficult case. It was chosen by the chief forecaster of the, uh, at the Met office, uh, independently of the project team. He said, give us a hard problem that we can use as an evaluation. And then we ran that problem. We actually collected a whole bunch of them and we ran it through our model and a bunch of other baselines and the previous um, system that, that uh, the Met Office was using. And we came up with these different results and we gave these to, uh, to meteorologists and said, how would you use this tool? How do you like these, these outputs? Because we wanted their uh, eyes on it. This should be, a, again, a tool for them, uh, not something uh, uh, for us. So in this case, we have a little storm brewing up here and you can see how the original observation, and then you can see how it changes at uh, plus 30 minutes, at 60 minutes, and at 90 minutes. And it evolves and uh, changes over time. And it's a di difficult to predict system because of the uh, small con convective cells there. And the traditional now casting system, this is what's used by, um, by the Met Office. It's called PiSteps. 
And this combines um, those uh, big numerical uh, models with uh, the actual radar sort of extrapolated forward using optical flow. Anyway, doesn't matter too much. If we take a look at it, then what we see is that even at plus 30 minutes, it's already degraded significantly from the ground truth above. It is hallucinating these gigantic storms, which didn't actually exist with very intense rainfall. Um, at, but more importantly, it's starting to really move the area where there's the intensity away from where it was. So even the shape of this is, is no longer accurate. So I'll just compare this against our method, which if you look at, you can certainly tell significant differences. Like I said, this is a hard problem. Um, uh, but you can also see that the shape and the areas of intensity are appropriate and correct. And we when we show this to meteorologists, they say, that's the one I want to use. This is the thing that I want to use if I'm going to deliver a forecast to the fine people of, of the UK. So um, this is, a, I think, a great example of uh, a new approach, it's AI methods and uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs, being brought to, to bear on an old problem. Um, and again, this is designed to complement, not replace uh, human expertise um, and provide decision-making value for meteorologists. All right, next stop um, is something that now this brings us, check my time, brings us um, even closer to, to us, I think. And this is the problem of machine translation. When, we, when I think about machine translation, I always think about Douglas Adams. Anyone? All right, good. Because Douglas Adams had a very simple problem for the sci-fi challenge of, you know, how do you talk about different people from different planets coming together without dealing with the problem of that they're not going to speak the same language? And he said, well, there's something called a, a babel fish. You stick the babel fish in your ear, and that allows you to immediately uh, uh, translate from any language to any other language. Um, that was science fiction when I was <laughs> reading Douglas Adams as, as a teenager. You know what? It's not science fiction anymore. I mean, it's not a fish. Um, I get, don't, 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 get, don't get me wrong. But what we do have is, um, is, uh, is, is a method built via AI methods that can translate from one language to another language as quickly as you can speak. And it doesn't, it's not as good as a human translator that knows that is bilingual and knows the two languages intimately and can translate really well. It's not that good, but it's good enough that I can talk to somebody. I can speak into my phone and it will immediately translate it and output it in another language. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And just to give a little bit of, of insight into uh, how this has developed, because this has been happening for the last 10 years, has been this revolution in machine translation. 10 years ago, the way in which machine translation worked was you started in your source language and you wanted to get to your target language. And you had a very, very modular system with a lot of very smart things in here. This is not trivial. This is a very complex system. But the understanding was that in order to do this well, you have to understand what it is. You have to parse it and chunk it. You have to do structural transfer. You have to do target generation. You have to do all of these different pieces of it separately in order to get from A to B. And what people started to do in the last 10 years is simply train a large unorganized machine and organize it to do the whole thing internally. In the same way that we learn to translate from one to the other, we don't develop separate modules in our brain to solve the different pieces of it in an analytical way. Instead, we learn from data and we figure out, and of course, internally, we're probably still doing the chunking and the parsing and the structural pieces of it, et cetera, but it's optimized much, much better if we can do it end to end from one to the other, using a lot of data and a large neural network. Um, so this, this has been what, what's, what's been happening and it works really well. I thought that I might, um, oh, and, and one more piece of it, which is um, WaveNet. So this is a separate part, 
WaveNet is an approach uh, for generating audio. So for a long time, machine translation was just something that happened in text. But you wouldn't have it actually, you wouldn't have um, uh, the system try to speak to you because it wouldn't come out, um, wouldn't come out sounding very good. It would end up coming out sounding like a robot. Um, uh, and WaveNet is an approach that was developed to generate raw audio. It is a generative network. And the interesting thing here is that it predicts each individual millisecond of that audio waveform one by one in a sequence. And you know, nobody really thought that this was possible or that this would work well, and it works surprisingly well. So conditioned on a piece of text that you want it to say, train this approach and you output audio that sounds pretty good. Um, probably not perfectly like a human, but I believe it halves the gap to human sounding audio. Let me, I just thought I'd give you an example of this. This is something that any of you can do if you go to Google Translate um, or other Translate apps, but um, I put together an example. You can go ahead and start this. I wanted to try translating English into French. And then I translated the into avocado data. is a pear shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. L'avocat est un fruit en forme de poire avec une peau coriace, une chair comestible lisse et un gros noyau. Avocadoen er en pæreformet frugt med læderagtig hud, glat spiseligt kød og en stor sten. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh and a large stone. All right, so I think that's pretty darn neat. It makes it very hard for me to convince my son that he should still take <laughs> languages in high school, um, but that's, that's, that's a different problem. But I think that the um, being able to speak to my phone, have it find the words correctly, immediately turn it into two different languages and speak it back in a legible form. Is it perfect? Probably not. And if any of you are, speak Danish, then I would love to know if, if it's accurate or not. Um, but, um, but it does awfully well. This is a really, really powerful technology and very exciting to me. All right, I am running out of time. So I will move ahead and just say briefly about, uh, say something about what is perhaps on the horizon. Um, and I wanted to talk about two things quickly. One is language models as the future of search. So what is a language model? So I talked, to, I mentioned chinchilla and it's 70 billion parameters. That is a language model. Is it, it is a large model trained on all of the web or at least all of the uh, English text on the web. Um, and the way it's trained is very simple. Predict the next word. Given a sequence of text, what's the next word? <laughs> um, so that fill in the blank way of training a network, very powerful when you've got a very large model and a lot of data. These models have gotten so good that they, you can have a conversation with them and they can say meaningful things and they can access what they have been trained on, which is a lot of data in the world. Now there's a lot of work to be done here, but I think that this will become in, the, in, in, in not too many more years, the next step for search. So just like now you can go to the, the, the search engine of your choice and look up things and get a listing of results. Now what you'll be able to do is talk to an expert. That search will still be, be valuable. But what if you want to ask questions about, the, about ancient Greek transcriptions or about running a marathon or about giraffes? You would be able to take this language model and it will have within it all of those experts. And 
the work that needs to be done is about making sure that that information is all verifiable, correct, and that you can understand where did this come from? Why did you give me this answer? But it will be able to have that depth of expertise and the ability to explain, which will make it very powerful. Not everybody can come to Cambridge and go to university here. This will be something that everybody will be able to have, just like everybody has access now to search engines to look up basic facts about the world. Now people will start to have the ability to know so much more um, about their world, gain that knowledge, gain that information. I think it will be important, um, important for the world, important for democracy. That's one thing coming soon to our world. And the second one I will point out is robotics. I have to talk about robots. I knew that they would be in here somewhere. Um, so robotics is difficult. I could give a whole talk. I have given whole talks on why robotics is hard um, and why uh, robotics as a field has not had quite the same transformations as we've seen in some other fields because of, of, of AI, such as machine translation. Um, I won't go into all of those, those aspects of why it's challenging, but I do think that um, what we are going to start to see is that robots that currently can only be in factories and very, very controlled environments, that usable robots are going to start to be, come into human spaces and be able to work with humans, be able to support humans on the things that we do in the world. So by that, I mean, let's think about construction. Humans do construction. It is something that is dangerous. It's hard, it's repetitive. And I'm not saying that humans shouldn't do construction. I'm saying humans should have a robot to help. <laughs> I'm saying that if we can develop robots that can be safely in the world with people, that can help with things like this in a general way, that will be incredibly powerful for the sort of work that we can do and for us being able to be safer in our jobs. Machines have been giving humans that ability for a long time to be able to be at a, um, to be a little bit safer, um, to be a little bit more comfortable. And I think that robots will do the same thing. In agriculture, I think it will have the same impact, but we need robots that are general enough, that can interact with humans and that can support humans in what they do. And the same thing with dealing with the debris of the world. Perhaps some of you have seen the movie WALL-E. I think that that was a, 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 a a visionary movie, because I think that we will end up in a world where we have robots that can deal with, well, hopefully not quite that world, it's a little bit post-apocalyptic, but <laughs> be able to have robots that can deal with um, the garbage, the recycling, things around us um, so that we don't have to. All right. Um, and just lastly, I want to say that I'm very happy that um, I haven't said too much about, about DeepMind. I do have a lot of faith that the work that we do, we think very carefully about how to do work. We collaborate with others, we collaborate with experts. And I think that responsible, responsibility is the most important thing for me in terms of developing um, these future tools and technologies. All right, that is a list of uh, the different, some of the different work that I talked about. Um, if you want to learn anything more about them, please feel free to look those up. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And it's uh, time for questions. Uh, so who would like to ask the first question? Uh, Jamie, do you have an online question? Oh, we have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Anne. Do we have a microphone? Uh, hold on a second. We're going to get this microphone that we pass around. Um, so that the people online can hear you. Yeah, so. that's the thing. The online audience won't be able to hear you unless you have a microphone. There we go. <laughs> it's a, yeah. <laughs> yes. How long does the experiment last? Yes. Uh, so the way in which the, the research facility, the, 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 this is run, it is a three second run. And so it's still, it's still much longer than most of them, but it's still not viable. No, it's not. Um, to be honest though, 
the, the uh, three seconds was dictated by uh, the um, by the researchers and how they, they run the facility. Um, and obviously we need to have a lot of confidence in what will happen if it is run for longer, but absolutely it still is run for three seconds and then requires 15 minutes um, in order to recharge in order to have the next three second run. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, so a Was it a deep mind talk or a Google talk? In collaboration with the uh, DB game, and they just read it, they just read it, and they want to be part of the lab. I don't know the game. Maria doesn't know either. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not positive. Um, it's quite possible. I know that there was a previous work um, that was that came out of the same group and was also focused on this. This is something that Giannis, the first author, has been working on for several years. Um, but I don't know particularly. I don't. No, could be. <laughs> we have one online question. Okay, I'll do that until we get the microphone fixed. Yeah. So this question is online from Max Dollinger. And he's asking about Turing's uh, idea that he had thinking about the minds of children and babies and how he trained it. Did he have any idea then about how we might punish or reward those who use computer systems for training? Um it's a good oh, so the, the the question asked um, was whether or not Turing had ideas about how reward or pu punishment feedback could be used um, in the training of, of, of systems. Um, he, I mean, I would suggest that people read the 1948 article. It's called Intelligent Machinery. Um, it, there's only a brief section, however, on the use of reward. And it falls short of developing rewards as an objective function as we use it now. We're thinking specifically about reward maximization. Um, more generally, it was about um, if you, uh, if the machine, if you insert random inputs, then you will get a range of different outputs and that you could use uh, a notion of reward or punishment in order to select between those and suppress some of those. So it was a way to modify the behavior um, but there really wasn't the notion there of, uh, of using something like gradient descent or this type of optimization that we use now, but really more a ma matter of um, after you have done exploration, how do you choose? How do you uh, choose the best and worst outcomes then? We have a question right here. It's a great, it's a great question. We need to repeat it first. Would you like to repeat it? <laughs> I don't think I can. <laughs> Maybe you could incorporate it in your answer. So the question was about weather forecasting and what it is exactly that we're doing with our neural networks that somehow avoids the challenges of the, the, the dynamical systems uh, that run uh, the partial differential equations and simulate the, the, the weather. Um, and um, the, the answer is, so we have explored a lot of different possibilities because one of the very interesting ways to approach this is to say, we know a lot about the physical constraints that must be happening. We know a lot about the weather and how, you know, what's happening in the, in the atmosphere. We can simulate a lot of that really well. So can we put together these well understood physical systems with something that is, that is learned from data? Because even though that, even though uh, that numerical model of the weather is very good. Of course, there's lots of things that are not observed. And all of those errors in the observation mean that the model is wrong. The model says it is raining, but it is not. So how can we combine data from observations um, with this and come up with something that's a little bit better? So that was, that's one approach um, very generally um, that we have worked on. What we have found to work better is simply using data. We treat this as a problem of pixels coming in 
and pixels coming out. We look at the past and we predict the future. And we would do it the, the, the same way, no matter what type of video it is. In this case, the video happens to be this layer of, of, of radar information, right? Precipitation information from radar moving across um, the moving across the, the, the earth. And what this means is that the answer, what we predict may be really wrong. And in fact, it is when the model starts out. The model says, oh, the rain just turns corner and goes that way and does something wacky. It's not obeying the physical constraints. But by observing a lot of data, training on a lot of data, it becomes more and more and more accurate to the point where it's more accurate than the, um, than the partially differentiable equations that don't have all of the that don't have all of the information. So um, essentially, what the system is is a, a neural network that sees we feed in, say, ten frames of, of data over time, and then we start to output frames after that. And then we um, and the neural network is a pretty big neural network, maybe twenty layers in it. Um, probably uh, maybe a billion parameters. I don't actually know for sure what the final model is. And then when we get an answer, is this wrong, is this, is this right? Then we use gradient descent and we uh, back propagate that error information back through the network. Um, that's, that's, that's how it works. Um, and with enough data, it becomes extremely good at solving that problem. If you roll it forward too far, if you try to say, can I predict the next day of weather, then it falls, it falls apart, right? And then the numerical method is, is doing better. It can simulate the dynamics of the weather better over a long-term period. But for that first hour or two, this method is better. Thank you. Uh, we have some online questions. I'll, I'll let Jamie uh, read those. Um, yeah, so we have a question from Tai Yang online. He's saying, do we today have a good theoretical foundation, a theoretical understanding of what's going on in these fantastically successful models that you've shown us? Hmm. Or, is it still, or is it still magic? <laughs> Asked by a theoretician. <laughs> um, so there is always uh, a lot, I think, more work to be done on sort of the more fun foundational questions um, and understanding from a theoretical point what's going on. We do understand a lot. Um, it's certainly not magic. Do we understand everything? Are there things that still surprise us? Um, no and yes. Uh, but you know, the, 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 this is why the field uh, has grown substantially because it's not just about people uh, seeing how many billions of parameters they can, they can train all at once on how many different machines using how much data, it's much more than that. It's understanding a lot of different things, how, we, um, how the optimization works, what bad optimization looks like, what underfitting looks like, overfitting, et cetera. And a lot of those start to, to become much more about the, the fundamental questions of uh, how is the network trained, um, theory, um, the, the theory of uh, capacity of networks um, and, and these sorts of, of, of ways of understanding it. Um, you know, computer science is a really is a really rich field, and I don't think that we can say that we are ever done with sort of the theoretical aspects of it, um, nor with the more applied and uh, empirical side of it. Okay, we'll take a, another question from online. Um, yeah, this question is from Tassin I. Shakli online. Uh, he writes, thank you, Dr. Hadsall. Do you think it's possible to build an embodied AI of real general intelligence without the machine having some sort of consciousness? I wish I could ask the person online if they would please define consciousness. <laughs> um, but that's the problem with answering questions that uh, come from. Um, so do I think that, is it possible to build an embodied um, agent that would have general intelligence and would not have consciousness um, or presumably self-awareness be another way to state that? To me, that I would go back to the neuroscience side of this and say it's important to start to have a really modern understanding of what consciousness is, what self-awareness is. 
When I think about consciousness, I think about having awareness of the past and being able to predict the future. That means that I understand my state in the world. I'm not just a reactive machine. And what we see is that that understanding, that if you look at animals, for instance, that we identify more intelligent animals as those that have a longer memory, like elephants, and are able to predict further into the future in order to change their actions. So when I think about consciousness, I don't think about it being on or off. One thing, you know, is it there, is it not? And have you passed the spot test, any of these things? What I think about it is instead is this range of awareness of where you are in the world, your power over making decisions that will affect your future and using your past in order to affect that decision making. And that is something that I think absolutely intelligent machines um, will have, will need to have. Remember that memory was one of Turing's critical components as well. Okay, here's a question from our, uh, our live audience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for your, your lecture. I noticed in it, you, you made a couple of value judgments in what was, in what, one was when you pointed to those faked photographs of people and said, that's a bad use of technology. And the other was at the end when in your penultimate slide, you, you said that the advances towards these horizons needed to be made responsibly and fairly. So my question is, do you have anything to say about governance of all of these developments within your thinking of, about uh, techniques and, and so forth and theory? Or would you say this is just a question for legislators and nothing to do with people like yourself? Yeah, very good question. And um, I would have dwelled a little bit longer on that slide, but I sensed that I was running short on time. Um, but this, this is an area that I, I feel quite, quite strongly about. Um, you're right that I pointed to the deep fakes and said, this is not a good use. On the other hand, Hollywood would disagree with me, right? I mean, the use of exactly this technology in Hollywood is, is blowing up. It's very important. I think that there are good uses for, for, for all of the technology that we build. Um, I think that it's, it's um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility. We can't just make technology, make new things and say, oh, how surprising um, that it was used for this. I work on robotics. It's very important to think really carefully about what is being enabled. Robotics is a classic dual use sort of technology. Um, you can use it to rescue people, you can put a gun on it. Um, and so you need to think about where are the risks and are the safeguards in place where they should be? That has to happen at multiple levels. Regulation, legislation has to be part of that. And what we've seen um, internationally is, in the last few years is countries starting to say, we need a policy on AI. We need to start thinking about this and we need to start doing the hard work of thinking about what's going to happen and how, how do we um, how do we regulate this or how do we put in, in guidelines? But the responsibility has to go a few steps lower than that as well. Um, I think it should come in academia as we teach students um, to be how to use data, how to think about applications, how to think about human data, human interactions, um, how bias is being built into the models. So this is something that needs to come in as we learn how to be technologists and scientists. Um, and you know, also from the, my point of view as a senior scientist, my role is, is somewhere, somewhere in between the two. I help DeepMind um, internally to decide whether or not enough work has gone into something, whether or not the right questions have been asked, the right mitigations have been put into place, if there is risks, et cetera. So I'm, you know, for me, that is um, thinking about AI uh, as something that where we all have some responsibility, people who touch it in different ways. Um, like I said, education, um, users and uh, startups, you know, startups need to take it seriously. Uh, I get very frustrated with uh, really irresponsible uh, startups. Big companies like DeepMind, Google, um, Meta, et cetera, need to take this seriously. And it also needs to be worked on at the governmental level as well. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have these. These technologies are, are wonderful, powerful, exciting things. Um, I think that, 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 that doesn't mean we should shut things down. Just understand the risks. 
our penultimate question. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for a very stimulating talk. Um, I, I have sort of two points to make. One of them is the computers seem sort of iterative. They just sequentially go through all the information. But is there a role for judgment and discernment in the machinery, or is that up to the humans? I mean, I think that's probably what we've been touching on, the question of judgment, discernment, what's right, what's wrong. That's the first okay. point. <laughs> okay, interesting question. Um, um, I think that there is a lot of ways in which uh, humans should be interacting. So a lot of the time, we are training on a lot of data. There is not room in that training process to bring in a human into the loop in the training process, especially of these really big neural networks. When you're training something with 70 billion parameters on all of the English text on the internet, that is a process that humans should not be involved in because it is a very, it's a, it's a, it's a massive operation. But that doesn't mean that we cannot then take that product and, be, uh, and interact with it as humans. Um, so that's sort of the, the large models trained on a lot of data, just for the purpose of, of making that process efficient enough. Um, it already takes uh, weeks or even months. Um, that needs to happen in sort of a very optimized fashion. But there's other types of algorithms, for instance, reinforcement algorithms, where we are actually interacting with the robot as it learns, with the system as it learns, and where human interaction to guide that process is very much a fund fundamental part of training. Um, so we've got some great work in, in robotics where humans are part of the training pro process to identify um, you know, how the robot should be solving a particular task. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, that, that type of work, that, that, that's, where, that's where humans come in. Um, and for other models, it's other things. So I don't think there's just sort of uh, one answer, but certainly human interaction with AI technologies is, is a fundamental part of, of what we're building. My, my second point is a robotics point. Um, I'm a classicist and I, I've been working on the new materialism, which argues that material objects, things have actually um, a re, an activity that they're alive in some way. And I just wanted to um, point out the robots in Homer. There are robots in, in Hephaestus's um, um, workshop. There are these maidens, these metallic maidens that move and obey the gods. And I just thought that might be of interest. Um, they don't seem to have any judgment or are they intelligent? We just don't know. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you. So our very last question, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So one more question from the online audience. Uh, this question is from Adam Barker, and he asks online, um, you've talked about these wonderful models where we train our systems with data, but what about situations where we fundamentally lack data, where we want to train our AI systems to potentially handle unexpected situations where there's just no chance that they've seen enough data? How can these sorts of models possibly handle those sorts of situations? Yeah, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. With, um, in some areas, we have scads of data. Um, uh, but in other areas, then data is very sparse or the data that we want to, to study might be very rare, like when we were studying anomalies, for instance. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a really, that there's a single answer to this. There's more of a, a toolbox um, of, 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 of tools and tricks of the trade and such. Uh, so we use simulation a lot. Simulation is often the way in which we get off the get get a system off the ground, um, and then we could maybe switch to training on on adding in real data. Um, uh, one also uses data augmentation a lot, where you take that little bit of real data that you have and you expand it by uh, making copies of the data. For instance, what if you're trying to identify an uh, particular type of, of storm in our, in our weather problem, but you've only seen that storm, you know, twice, that type of, of, um, uh, of event a couple of times in the last three years. Well, what you can do is change that a little bit. You can move it, you can adapt it in some ways in your data set so that it looks like it's something a little bit different. Um, and that gives you a way to train on something that's very rare and make it a little bit less rare. Um, so that's, that's the general practice of data augmentation. 
that's really powerful. So there's, there's not a, a magic uh, cure here. These models do require a lot of data. There's no way to get that performance without having a lot of data. But simulation, data augmentation, other clever ways of an, increasing the data uh, can be really helpful. Okay, thank you. I think it's time to, for us to thank our speaker uh, once more. Uh, thank you.